All right, Christy, what do you see? I can yeah. see it. Yep, yeah, it's live. We are good. We are live. We've got it going. All right. Uh, Lexington, we appreciate your patience. Uh, I am Kevin Hall. I'm the communications officer at the Lexington Fayette County Health Department. We are running a few week, a few minutes behind, not a few weeks behind, just a few minutes mm -hmm. behind. You'll bear with me. I am checking this out on my phone because I want to share what we're going to be talking about today with everybody I know. We're going to be talking about COVID-19 and how it is affecting African Americans in Lexington. So for our guests who are participating, if you all wouldn't mind making sure that we're, you can share this. Um, for those of you who are streaming right now, go ahead and join. Uh, make sure that you can uh, tag some friends, tag some people who want to be a part of this, because we're going to have a good, honest discussion about race and COVID-19. Uh, this is a fluid situation and we're learning as we go, including the technology available to do this. So we are, it's a little bit different. It's, we're in a new world. So for our producer on the back end, Christy Nitwick, people who are watching, you're probably seeing this stream through her personal page. This is legit. This is still through the health department. She's a communications member here and is helping produce this. We're having to work through some of the problems with technology but now we're gonna focus on the benefits of technology because we are all physical distancing here. None of us are together. There's definitely more than six feet apart. We're following good public health guidelines. What I wanna to talk to you about right now is this is such an important topic. We wanna to thank you for joining us on Facebook Live here at the health department. Again, I'm your host, Kevin Hall, and we're gonna be talking uh, about COVID-19. I'm going to keep asking for more your patience as more people join us. Take a few moments, share this, tag some people on it, send texts, whatever you can do. Tell them we know that it's supposed to start earlier, but we're ready now and we want you to watch to learn about COVID-19. So it's been more than a month since Lexington has had its first confirmed case of COVID-19. And for those of us working in this response, it's hard to believe. It seems like it's been much, much longer than that. And Dr. Humble, I'm sure can attest to that. There have been a lot of hours put into this. And in that month, as of April 8th, so yesterday, we've had 183 confirmed cases and 28% of those here in Lexington were African-Americans. Lexington's African-American population is about 15%. And we're here today to talk about this concerning trend in many US cities. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting African-Americans. So again, it's gonna be around 30% of the cases and 15% of the population. That's not matching up there. We wanna talk about that. We're joined today by some community leaders to start a conversation about this troubling trend. We're not gonna be able to solve the problem today. And that's not what this Facebook Live is trying to accomplish. What we are doing, though, is having an honest talk about COVID-19 and race with a hope of improving outreach of important public health information. This won't be the last time we're getting together to talk about this either, so keep an eye out for future discussions with more Lexington leaders. Today, we are joined by Pastor Keith Tyler. Pastor Tyler is in the bottom left of our screen. He is the president of Lexington's Interdenominational Pastoral Fellowship. We're pleased to have him today. Casey Allen Bryant is our Board of Health Chair, among many titles. She's also <laughs> going to be talking today as a public health uh, professional, as a nurse, and also at the very and probably most important title as a mother. Uh, we're joined with hip hop artist and community activist Divine Karama. Divine has been a part of public health initiatives to stop uh, overdoses. He's been vocal to, with us about naloxone and the importance of carrying the spray. And he's using that influence today and his recognition in Lexington to talk to a younger audience, hopefully, about why this is an important discussion to have. And then we are joined uh, with, as always, with Commissioner of Health, Dr. Craig Humbaugh, who is uh, here in the building, away from me, social distancing. He's going to answer any public health questions that come up from our panelists. Now, for those of you watching, 
we're not going to be able to take many questions, if any, as we move through this. We want you, we want to try to have this discussion among our panelists. But if you have questions, you can send those in. We can possibly be addressed at future discussions. I want to give a very special thanks to Christy, Christy Nitwick working behind the scenes to produce this while healthy at home. And I want to tell, give a very, very special heartfelt thanks to Mayor Linda Gordon. Andrea James and Laura Hatfield on helping getting this conversation going. And with that, let's get the conversation going. Dr. Humbaugh, can you first start us off with a, just a brief update on COVID-19? Sure, Kevin. And I'd like to thank all you and all the panelists today um, for being with us to raise awareness about this issue. So COVID-19, as, as many of our viewers know, is a new type of coronavirus that emerged late last year in China is now circling the globe. Um, it's been called a pandemic, which is simply the spread of infection that is a worldwide epidemic. And that's because no one on earth has immunity to this particular virus. So how does this virus COVID-19 spread? It's much like any other respiratory illness like the flu, for instance. So people who are contagious can spread this disease through um, tiny droplets that they expel when they cough or when they sneeze. The virus is contained in those droplets and somebody who's susceptible, and remember we're all non-immune, we're all susceptible, we breathe that in and then we become infected. A secondary way of becoming infected is that you as a susceptible person touch an object that's been contaminated with virus by somebody's cough or sneeze. And then you put your unwashed hands on your face, in, in your mouth, in your nose, on your eyes. And, and we all do that, unfortunately, we all, um, unconsciously do that, so we have to remember that that's also a way that this can spread. So why has this particular pandemic or epidemic been so hard to control or stop? Well, number one is we don't have any vaccine available right now to, to, to produce any immunity in the population. The other problem is that many people have really mild illness and you would think that's a good thing, and it is. However, they can potentially pass the virus on to those who are much more severely affected. And those who are likely to be more severely affected are older people and those with chronic illnesses. So, um, and then those are potentially can even uh, have be hospitalized or die. So, when Kevin, when you talked about what does it disproportionately mean that African Americans are ha, have been affected, that means that since people of color in Lexington make up about 15% of the population, we would expect about 15% of our cases in Lexington to be people of color. But in fact, what we're finding is about 30% of our cases um, are people of color. So that's out of proportion to what we would expect. And that's why we're having this discussion today. Um, yeah, I would say for those of you who are just joining us, we started this off by saying we're not here today. We don't have the answers to why this is happening. We want to, we want to start that conversation <laughs> and with these community leaders to find out what more can be done, to help improve the outreach and some of the barriers and obstacles that, that, we're, that, that we're facing uh, in Lexington with this issue. Uh, you know, I, I, let, let me start things off, uh, if I can, with Pastor Tyler. Uh, Pastor Tyler, you reached out to the mayor's office uh, to show an interest in getting a discussion going. At the same time, the health department was working behind the scenes of saying, how can we get some people together to talk about this? And we were able to bring this together very quickly. We appreciate your interest in this. Why, for you, as a minister, for, you told me, I think you've been in Lexington, what, almost two decades now, if not longer. Why is this so important to you to, to, to talk about this for Lexington? Well, thanks, Kevin, and to all the panelists, we thank God for you. Um, and to our honorable uh, mayor, Linda Gorton, and her staff, and of course, to the one and only uh, Laura Hetfield uh, for being very studious and uh, working aggressively to assist us in this endeavor of gathering 
the people and persons together. Uh, you had asked me some questions and maybe one or two questions. I can kind of put it all together, but um, in probably one nutshell, if you would, Kevin. The historical reflection of on African Americans on Blacks dates back to 400 years um, from August the 20th, 1619, um, Jamestown, Virginia, when 20 Blacks were brought to American soil, uh, coming here thinking to make a better life, uh, but not so much for themselves, but for others. Uh, you fast forward 400 plus years into the present age, the 21st century age we are in now, and we are seeing the, um, I would say, the continuation of the collateral damage of economic instability, uh, uh, real estate, or better yet, a state ownership, um, a lot of the disparity within our community as it relates to family structure, uh, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, gentrification, redlining, and on and on. With that being said, our collective um, uh, gathering and um, I would say entertainment is with one another. Um, we normally come together, the backyard barbecues, the Medeas, family reunion episodes is a great highlight of our fellowship and our kinship. And with that being said, I've been noticing a trend. I serve also as president for the Progressive National Baptist Convention Midwest region, which covers eight states, all the way from Kentucky, all the way to Arizona, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio. And I'm noticing a trend that is spreading across the nation as it relates to the escalating statistics uh, with Blacks or African-Americans, if you would. And with that being said, that sends an alarm <laughs> to me that we must uh, do a concerted effort to air out and to vent and to share in many venues uh, with Blacks that, hey, we are in the higher statistics. And let me pause and I'll say this and I'll turn it back over. We also must be mindful and considerate that the Black race is not a target race. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying that due to the economic instability, our gathering, our probably not being informed correctly. Some have even put out the uh, misnomer that blacks were immune to it. I don't know where that came from. Uh, and then also you have poor health uh, conditions. You have also the genetics. You have also the current health status as it relates to diabetes and blood pressure. And so the awareness is paramount that they would hear, that people will hear across the sector from many venues beside the pulpit. Uh, the black church is still the ultimate um, pinnacle of hope for the black community. And the black preacher is still looked upon as the black prophet for the community. And so with that being said, I'll pause right there. This sparked an interest. Um, and uh, when it did, it sparked an interest from the perspective of the numbers. For Louisiana, for every 10 positive cases, uh, seven out of those 10 positive cases are blacks. As you continue hitting the thread of stats and data, you find that trend spreading all across America. And so I'll, I'll turn it over to you, but that's really the press that I have is to air out the awareness, to encourage our people, encourage people abroad of the seriousness of this pandemic. All right, thank you, Pastor. Uh, you know, Casey, he mentioned something that you talked about when we were prepping uh, before, the, before this meeting, uh, that I'd like, to, like to get your thoughts on. But before I do that, I want to uh, re-emphasize people, although we are talking about data, do not mistake that to mean that we aren't talking about people. And the health department is talking about data so that we can help people. And <clears throat> nobody in this is a number or a statistic. And the, num the data and the, uh, that we're talking about is to give us the information to be able to do a better job of protecting all of Lexington on this. And I want to, I really want that message to be, to be heard because it can get lost in that when you start talking about percents and rates. We're talking about real humans and real people and real members of, of Lexington. Casey, uh, the pastor mentioned about some of the historical barriers that, have, that have, have come up. You, you mentioned uh, some, some of the things from a health perspective. Could you elaborate to the people who who are listening and who are privy to our private conversation. <laughs> Correct. 
Thank you, Kevin, for inviting me today again. Um, you know, I'm not just here because I'm the Board of Health Chair. Uh, like you said, I'm also an African-American working mother nurse among of my many titles. And so that is why this topic isn't so important to me. This is my community. And so I want to make sure that we are trying to open these conversations. And I do want to say first, before I get into some historical context, is that I am so very proud of our staff at the Lexington Fayette County Health Department. We have really gotten out in front of this issue. If you look across the nation, I mean, we're, you know, one of the few health departments that have opened this dialogue. I mean, holding a forum such as this is a great first step. And we've always, as a health department, been interested in health equity, no matter whether it's diabetes, hypertension, and now COVID. And so this is just part of our mission is helping Lexington be well, and then also making sure that health is equitable among all communities in our in Fayette County. From a historical concept. And I, I, I'm a public health nurse and I'm always looking to see why is it that our, our African Americans are not uh, accessing health care. And so if you look historically uh, to it, you know, there were things in the history like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment where the U.S. Public Health Service, they studied the progression of untreated syphilis among rural African American men in Alabama. And when penicillin became the drug of choice for syphilis, they purposely withheld this medication from the men. And so these are, that's a story that's been passed down amongst generations. The other story is the Hen Henrietta Lacks. So it's a little less known story that from our history. Ms. Lack, she died of cervical cancer in 1951. And without her knowledge or her family's permission, their, fa their family's knowledge, they used her cells for well over 74,000 studies. And these examples, along with the anticipation of experiencing prejudice and stigma from healthcare providers, are part of the reasons that African Americans are less likely to access care. Piggybacking on what Dr. Tyler said, you know, we are less likely to go to the doctor as soon as we have a hiccup, a cold, a sore throat. I mean, our ancestors, you know, as a mother, uh, 400 years ago, were giving birth in the fields. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of that, sto that stoic view on pains and aches follows through to us. And so that is one of the reasons why we are less likely to um, access health care. And that's an issue because we don't often go when it's still in a, a early phase where many of the complications can be prevented. You know, uh, Devon, I want to ask you a question on um, because sure. it's, it's not just a historic barriers. These aren't there aren't just barriers that were years and years and years ago. We talked pr prior to this about how you've got concerns where young black men are afraid to wear the homemade cloth mask out in public. Could you speak to that a little bit and about some of what, what those concerns are for you? Um, sure, and just piggybacking off what, what Casey and, and Pastor were saying, there are definitely some historical things that um, lead our community not um, to go to the doctor, but then there are also some present constructs um, that are enabling us to even afford to go to the doctor on a regular basis. Um, when you start looking at statistics, you got to start looking at the disp you know, disproportionate amount of African Americans that are going to jail. Um, you got to start looking at jobs. You got to start looking at employment, educational opportunities. Um, because I know as a single father who was in, in poverty for quite a long time, I know that it was my living conditions that actually kept me from the doctor's office. Um, you know, the job that I had entry level didn't have employer based health care. So I had to go get it on my own, but then I couldn't afford it being a single father. Um, so what happens is, you know, you're, you're already struggling, um, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you're not going to go to the doctor and accrue uh, a bill that you can't afford to pay. So you don't go. Um, and a lot of um, the issues that are prevalent within African American community um, are things that could be treated, are things that could be helped if, the, if you're 
you know, going to the doctor on a regular basis. And a lot of these things that are prevalent in our community leave us more susceptible to um, COVID. Um, when you talk about heart disease, obesity, talk about diabetes, those are things that we could get help with if we we're consistently um, being able to go to the doctor. So I think this kind of highlights some issues that we have systematically um, in our country in regards to race and class. Um, but doubling back to your original question, um, being as somebody that's worked with young people for a long time, um, I think it's really more of an issue of just how serious they're taking this and less of, um, you know, the fashion, you know, the, you know, um, the fashionness of, of wearing a mask. Um, I, I think it's just young people aren't taking this as serious and I think they're misinformed. Um, I know a lot of young people um, that I work with. I got two high school daughters. Um, and, you know, a lot of times they're getting their news from their timeline and that's it. Um, you know, sometimes the information they gather um, doesn't go any further than a meme on Instagram or Twitter. Um, you know, so they're not really getting the proper information. Therefore, they're not really taking this serious. Um, and, and out of respect for time, I'll go back to you. I was, I was, and the proper information is why we want to talk about this today. I, I will put a plug in for the health department that if you go, if you follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash LFCHD, or go, go to LFCHD.org, that's where you can get great information in Lexington. Uh, and it gets amplified by many people in the community sharing and spreading that. So uh, the getting the proper information is a key component. So thank you for bringing that up, Divine. Uh, word that has been used a few times is health equity or phrase a few times is health equity. And one of the best ways that I've ever heard this explained is that equality is going to a school and taking every child there size nine shoes. Equity is going to the school and taking size nines and size 12s and finding out what is available for everyone that in there to make sure that you meet the needs of the people who are getting the services you're providing. So there is a huge difference between equality and equity. Tara Mason, one of our health, leader of our health equity team is the one who taught me that and it stuck with me because it's great. So when you, those of you listening who aren't in public health and you hear health equity, that's, what, that's a great way to, to picture that. Uh, it's breaking down the barriers and making sure the individual gets what is needed. Um, Pastor Toller, I wanna, I wanna come back to you. We normally, a great avenue of reaching people in all of Lexington and all of Central Kentucky, but particularly in an African-American community is going to a church, going through the church. Because as you said, the pastors at these places are, are centralized figures of information. That is a impossibility in a physical sense right now because people are following the governor's orders and the churches are closed. The church buildings are closed. The church itself in a broad term is open. What are the issues you're still hearing or seeing from people in the faith community uh, as it relates to COVID-19? Well, um, let me uh, speak from the perspective of um, my, um, my experience um, within the, the Black church uh, community over 30 years, and then I'll fast forward to where we are. Um, there are those who are informed, there are those who are misinformed, and, um, and then there are those who are not informed at all. Uh, with that being said, uh, secondhand information begins to spread rapidly, and oftentimes the secondhand information is um, a collective of other voices and other opinions and viewpoints and philosophies. In the community of the 21st century church, you have uh, new paradigm shifts, new gospels, grab it and claim it, name it and snap it, speak into the atmosphere. There's a fallacy instead of a faith uh, due to the improper foundation of belief. And with that being said, there are many people who are running after that. Um, there is, I teach the church I pastor, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, that we walk by faith and not by sight, which is, um, which implies we don't walk by foolishness, we walk by faith. Uh, there are those that are practicing good disciplines, 
in the black church community. They are uh, Facebook Live. A lot of my peers are Facebook Live, social media. But then there are, there are some who are challenging the stats and challenging the data. Um, and we're beginning to learn slowly that that is beginning to dissipate. And so with that being said, there are to the salute and to the to the applause of, of a lot of the peers in, in the church community, they are adhering uh, to what the governor and the mayor has asked for us to do, and of course the health professionals. Uh, the church now is beginning to reach other church, which means the church started in homes, and so now the church is beginning to, uh, believe it or not, God has strange strategies, gathering homes again. And so Facebook Live and other social media becomes the medium for that. Um, but however, as I said earlier, if, if my numbers are correct, I can just roughly say there are about 40,000, uh, at least 40,000 uh, Blacks in Lexington, Fayette County. Uh, and those are 40,000 of this relationship to those that are registered, which means that we do not have 40,000 that um, are uh, on the venues of, of communication of the Black church, per se. Whereas when the governor or the mayor, there's a totally different venue. It's a more broader venue. And so what I am proposing is that we tap into all venues um, and that a, a very diverse people are speaking, uh, especially the Black clergy, uh, because the Black clergy is a Black voice for the communities of Blacks, even for those who don't go to church. So the church may reach some, but not all. But I do see a collectiveness uh, in the church, uh, in the church uh, circles, uh, which I am affiliated with, and the pastors who are doing their best. Last but not least, people are crying out asking, now what? What's next? How do we rebound from this? How do we out? What, what, what would be the outcome? There is no template for our data. There is no model that has been put in place. Uh, we're working on that, but at the same token, there is none. And so we'll talk about that in the next chapter, but they're starting to ask, how do we rebound? How do we rebound economically? We understand the spiritual, but how do we rebound with our families? You have parents in some cases that are educationally challenged, your home book at home. So there, there are so many different um, issues, systemic issues that are facing uh, the black community as it relates to the black church that I will not take up the time to discuss in this, on this platform, in this venue, but we are working collectively to help to um, offset these stats. And even with the work that we're doing in the black community and the black church, they are still escalating. And so it is my prayer that as this Facebook Live platform is being aired and many are hearing it, that um, the other pastors that have yet to come aboard, that we're gonna bring aboard, uh, they need to hear from every pastor, every clergy. They need to hear on different venues and different platforms of the urgency of this hour. Appreciate that, Pastor Tyler. Dr. Humball, let me ask you a question. Uh, could you explain to the people watching uh, through Facebook Live a little bit about what we mean by physical distancing or what they've heard as social distancing and why you prefer the term physical distancing? Sure, Kevin. So um, physical distancing is an important way for us to help slow the spread of this virus. And physical distancing means staying at least six feet apart from one another, avoiding unnecessary trips outside of the house, staying at home if necessary. And the reason I like the term physical distancing as opposed to social distancing is I feel like we can be physically apart, but now that we have our electronic devices in the year 2020, we can still remain socially connected. And I think that's important because we don't want members of our community to become isolated. That's an important part of their mental health to be socially connected. But right. We have the capability, if we use our technology wisely, like we're doing with this Facebook Live today, to be able to be connected with friends and family um, electronically and still be physically distant. And that's going to help us slow the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Humbaugh. Casey, one of the things, again, I'm, you, you gave me a lot of great information before we started this. You talked about some of the cultural issues 
that come up with African Americans and why sometimes why this is going to be difficult to, with the spread of COVID-19. And I want I want to emphasize this. This is not meant to say that only that Black people in Lexington are the people who are needing to hear this. This is not that at all because this is COVID-19 is affecting every single person in Lexington. And this is not meant to be that anyone is necessarily doing anything wrong. We're having this discussion today to have this honest talk about what we as a public health agency at the health department, what Lexington as a collective group can do to help offset these numbers where 30% of our cases of COVID-19 are affecting African-Americans compared to just 15% of the population. And it's just a trend that's happening in other cities. But Casey, could you talk about some of the cultural pieces that you had mentioned to me? Absolutely. And I think it was Divine, or maybe it was Pastor Tyler that said this before about the reunions, but we like to get together. <laughs> I mean, we really, we're a very social, I mean, uh, culture. And so, you know, everything from the infamous Sunday dinner to the Friday night barbecue to everything. But, you know, during these times, we need to give those up. Uh, or do them virtually, like, like Dr. Humbaugh suggested. Um, the people visiting households mixing is not the way to go. I think a lot of people are like, well, we're all family. We're not going to spread it to each other. Yes, you will. <laughs> and so um, you can't, you have, you have to keep those households separate. And so this is not the time, you know, everybody's off work for whether it's a good because they can work from home or maybe bad because they've been laid off. But now it's not the time to go visiting. Now it's not the time to have social parties. It's not the time to do the, the group barbecues. We love those things. Yes. Um, we're going to, I know we're going to talk about Easter a little bit later. Also, you know, ladies, it's been hard for me. <laughs> I know it's been hard for you, but we can't get that professional hairstylist to come into our, our homes and do our hair. Fellas, you can't get the, the fades and, and get your lined up. You can't bring your stylus in there. This is not the time for you. <laughs> did you shave that yourself? I do, I do my own. You I just got to shave. Okay, okay. I, I hear you. It's a so, great time for people to learn learn new hobbies, right? Learn That's new right. hobbies. And it is, <laughs> it is very challenging. Our hair is very important in our community. And the thought of going without your hairstylist or going without your barber is unthinkable to some people, but in these times, it must be. Again, you don't want to mix households. You want to maintain that physical distancing, that social distancing. You know, uh, Divine, I, I saw something on your Facebook uh, that, I, that intrigued me. Speaking of the technology part, you are a musician. You are a uh, pretty well-known hip-hop artist in Central Kentucky and Lexington. Uh, you've been doing concerts without an audience. And I feel like if you are able to, to make the shift, what, and you can get others to do that as well. Like it, it is hard for an artist to perform in front of an empty room, but what has that been like for you? And how can you use that message to get other people to make shifts in some of their habits to protect everyone? Sure. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing to remember um, when we see you know churches our preachers preaching in front of empty churches on Sundays, when we see artists like myself performing in empty concert halls and streaming it live, or, you know, parents um, essentially homeschooling um, for the next few weeks, all of us are having to make adjustments. And I think finding the solidarity in that and just knowing that, that you know, none of us are exempt to the adjustments that have to be made. So that kind of gives me peace just knowing that, you know, all my fellow Kentuckians and, and Americans are going through the same thing and people all over the world. So for me, um, it is exactly what you said, just finding creative ways to still inspire, um, to still perform and do what you love to do and uplift people, um, but do it um, abiding by the, the social distancing or the physical distancing guidelines. So um, we just did a virtual um, poetry open mic night the other night. Um, mm -hmm. The last 13 years, we've done an open mic called Poetry in Motion. And um, obviously, we all couldn't meet at, at Creo and have a drink and, <laughs> and you know, watch poetry. Um, but what we did is poets just submitted or went live on Facebook with their, their poems. And then we used the hashtag to connect us all. So then we can all go back and watch and still enjoy the poetry 
Um, and, you know, uplifting art and culture and music is something that people need in these times. So as an artist, it's been rough. Um, financially, it's been been rough as a youth programmer and an artist. Um, a lot of what I do um, requires people to come together. Um, so a lot of my income has been stifled. But everything I do isn't just for the income. It's to inspire people and bring them together. And we can still do that um, in creative ways using technology. It's been inspiring to see how Lexington has banded together. Most of Kentucky has banded together to come to come together to meet this head on. Uh, one phrase that you hear often is we're all in this together. And while that is nice to hear and it is encouraging, inspiring, it's not it's also a bit misleading. Casey, you've talked a little bit about how there are some social and uh, economic barriers that we're not all in this together. You want to talk about that a little bit more? Sorry, I've got a barking dog in the background. <laughs> I apologize. It's just the, one of the challenges of being at home. Um, could you repeat the question? I am having a very hard time hearing you. <laughs> they, okay, I'll try it again. Uh, we, uh, we hear the phrase, we are all in this together. And mm -hmm. it's very inspiring and it's encouraging and uplifting. But it's not necessarily entirely true. It can be misleading because that implies that we all face the same situations and they all had the same conditions and you've talked with me a little bit about some of the uh, the societal some of the income pieces some of the job pieces that can cause some barriers particularly for African Americans could you absolutely. speak to that a little bit more yes absolutely so you know I, I am very blessed to be able to work from home but many of us are not and so to say to a parent that you have to stay home with your family, with your kids, and not to mix households can be very difficult. I mean, we as a, as a culture, you know, we very much believe in it takes a village. And we're used to having you know, grandparents, aunties, uncles, godparents. I mean, we involve everybody in the rearing of our children. And so to say, no, you're, you cannot have your grandmother come into the home, or no, you cannot go to grandmother's house, is a big pill to swallow and some of us are not accepting it it's like well it's okay it's family but we know like dr hoppa said we need to practice that social and that physical distancing let's get to a topic that was mentioned earlier and it is on a lot of people's mind for this weekend i know the governor even said that the easter bunny is an essential worker uh but easter is coming up that is a time for typically for families to get together. What messages, I'm gonna throw this out to everyone. We'll start with Pastor Tyler. What message do you have for people, particularly people who are used to going to church on Easter Sunday? What do you have want to tell them about why it's so important to follow those social distancing guidelines on Easter weekend? Sure, thanks, Kevin. Uh, let me uh, preference by saying, um, Bishop Eddie Long, who is now resting in the grave, had mentioned years ago that um, he has foreseen a shaking and a turning point in the body of Christ, meaning that a return back to basics. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3, you read the beginning of the birth of the first century church, and you would discover they did not have large buildings uh, to gather in. Uh, they didn't have the ambiances of a beautiful sanctuary, but they met in various places and yards and homes um, on the wayside, uh, down by the river, wherever they could congregate, they met. And that is what is happening today. There are some churches that are going to have what is called park and church. In other words, in their parking lots, kind of like the old uh, drive-in movie, uh, atmosphere. I'm telling my age when we were young, we'd go to the drive-in. and We, we may uh, explain that for the younger audience. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I know. I didn't kind of spill the beans, but um, we would go to the drive-in and sit in the car and, and watch the movies. Uh, that's going to take place in some of the churches. That's one of the goals we have. Uh, we have already issued uh, about the six feet uh, staying in the car apart. Each car is parked uh, within a six feet or six foot um, uh, uh, perimeter away from each other. Uh, however, uh, and I don't want to take up too much time uh, and be too laborious on this topic, 
there are those within the realm of religion uh, that are using this to their advantage uh, financially. Um, they are selling uh, pseudo oil and pseudo miracle water and pseudo miracle healing cloths, claiming divine healing for COVID-19 and uh, claiming divine protection from COVID-19. And that is a total fallacy, a total fallacy. And so Sunday, we're gonna be sharing with the congregation uh, and those who come out. And we'll also do our Facebook Live um, as well uh, about uh, the, the necessity of gates. I'm gonna use gates as a metaphor. And uh, we're gonna share with them how we have to gate ourselves off. And it is very difficult. Casey had mentioned about the social gathering as it relates to a people of, of black descent and for many in Kentucky, um, I think uh, data says that 8% of Blacks in the state of Kentucky, the state of Kentucky, we don't have the ambiances and the amenities uh, to gather in, in large estates. We don't have it. Many of us are on top of each other already. Uh, many of us are just trying to survive. And so the separation, the social distancing is a very, is, is an extreme challenge. It's an extreme challenge. And, but yet instead we are pushing and encouraging people to do that. So from the Easter perspective, no, we will not be able to see all the Easter hats and the little Easter bunnies and everybody dressed up and et cetera, et cetera. But we are gonna celebrate Easter, but we're gonna do it twofold. One from the parking lot, uh, weather permitting and also Facebook Live. And I want to encourage everyone else to do that uh, as well. Divine, how about you? What message do you have for the people viewing this on why it's so important, particularly going into Easter weekend, to keep following these guidelines as we flatten the curve? To hear that phrase you say, as we try to uh, keep these numbers down and keep people safe. Sure, I I think that we just got to look at look at the long game. Um, you know, having a mother that is kind of in that high risk. Um, portion of the population, um, having a pacemaker and being of that age, um, seeing the numbers kind of trickle up each day. Um, I'm starting to see people in my timeline that I either grew up with or know personally um, that are being impacted and affected. Um, you know, I understand that this is a big weekend. Um, as, a, as a man of faith, um, this is a huge weekend for me each and every year. Um, but we can still praise the Lord. We can still have Easter Sunday, um, maintaining those social distancing guidelines. I just think this, you know, this is an unprecedented time that we are in. Um, this is going to be in the history books and, and something that may not happen again in our lifetime. And I think that people just have to understand that. And, you know, we just, you know, we, we you know, is th this is an adjustment. I mean, I was just talking to my wife last night that I can't believe that you know, this is going to be the first Easter since I've been alive that I'm not going to be in a church, in a physical church. Um, but when we think about um, those that have already passed, when we think about those that are struggling, trying to recover, when we think about those that are infected, um, you know, until we get a vaccine, until we you know, find a vaccine for this, um, the power um, essentially is in our hands when it comes to flattening that curve. Um, and we just got to stay in, got to stay home. So, you know, I implore people, you know, to as uncomfortable as it is, we just got to stay home. Um, we got to abide by the guidelines. Um, our governor has been great in leading us. You look at the polls and Kentucky's at the top as far as states that's dealing with this this coronavirus. Um, so, you know, I, look, as a man of faith, it, it hurts me. Um, it's going to be a struggle this weekend, but it's what we have to do. Casey, I've said already, you're a nurse, you're a mom, you have many different titles, but as a nurse and a mom, what are you doing in your home with your kids, with your family, as it pertains to COVID-19 protections, physical distancing, you can talk about what, maybe what, even what you've got planned for Easter to put some of this together. Right, so I'll start, I'll start with Easter first, because, you know, the first thing the kids said was, well, what about the Easter bunny? You know, the Easter bunny, We'll visit our home, uh, but we will not be 
getting dressed in their Easter outfits. You know, we will not have the Easter outfit parade at church. We will not have the Easter egg hunts. And so some of the, we've got some activities planned here. I've found some good online activities for children to help them understand the true meaning of Easter, which is not about the Easter bunny. And we'll have a little Easter egg hunt in the backyard and uh, put those outfits on and they can model for their dad and I, and we'll just have to modify it as well. I mean, it's hard for them. They, they want to go to church. They want to go see their relatives. They want to have that big family dinner, but we just can't do it. And I've ex explained it to them and they're, they're still disappointed, but it's, um, you know, it is what it is. And they're, they are learning to have to accept the changes in their lives. In terms of what we're doing at our home, well, my kids are somewhat young. I have a 12 year old and an eight year old. And so we do a lot of reminders for hand washing. I mean, not just the typical before you eat or after you use the bathroom, but also I tell them if you've been outside, wash your hands. If you have, uh, before you touch your face, wash your hands before you brush your teeth, wash yours. I'm constantly, I mean, I have soap all over the house, every single bathroom sink got hand sanitizers set out all over the house, my little hand sanitizing stations and getting them in the routine of doing that. We also try to hinder them from touching their face, which is difficult. Kids are constantly touching their face, putting their fingers in their mouths and, and whatnot. And so making it a game out of it, like, for instance, you could say every time that somebody touches their face, they have to get up and do a jumping jack. And they, they love that, especially with their dad. <laughs> and make him get up and do a jumping jack. So just making it fun and making it a game as much as possible to keep them in it and model that behavior for them as well. And we're also focusing on other healthy habits. And so I know we talk a lot about COVID and improper hygiene, but especially knowing that because my children are the ways that they are, that their likelihood of developing diabetes and hypertension is so great that we try to focus on getting outside, getting physically active, again, while maintaining that social distancing, that physical distancing, and making those healthy food choices as much as possible. All right, got time for just a real quick couple of questions. Want to try to keep these answers moving if we can, because uh, we need to wrap up. And Dr. Humbaugh's got investigations to go leave <laughs> one. So, uh, what can we, as a as the public health department here in Lexington, Lexington Bay County Health Department, how can we improve our outreach to let more people understand how serious COVID nineteen is? Pastor Tyler, we're going to start with you. And if, give us a quick answer on how we can improve our outreach. I believe that uh, what we're doing now is helping tremendously. We're reaching different audiences that are tagging. Uh, I would also uh, employ uh, a follow-up. Uh, we need to hear from the community. We need some replies from the community um, as it relates to this discussion and COVID-19, what they are doing to help minimize the stats and what they see that needs uh, maybe some policing within their own social gathering. And last but not least, I would also uh, encourage um, uh, our health department and, and whatever resources we have uh, to continue with the breakdown of the data. Um, we need to be more so mindful of why or how, if not both, Blacks are escalating. What is causing this escalation? I know there is no one answer, no one solution, but I am old school. I believe that with every um, description, there ought to be a prescription. And so with that being said, I would like to chime in and encourage all of the clergy uh, to be a part of this. So as well, they can take ownership in their own ministries and continue practicing the social distancing, wearing the face mask or the covering, uh, staying within your family circle as much as possible. You actually, you, you hit my last question for you too. It was going to be, what's one last message you want to leave people with? So we'll, we'll let you cover both of those there. We'll, we'll go over to Divine. What can we do? How can outreach be improved to reach more people in Lexington on the seriousness of this? Sure. I, I think we need to do one of these, maybe focusing specifically on the youth. Um, you know, as somebody who, who works with young people, they're really, really struggling. You know, I got two daughters that were supposed to walk across the graduation stage um, this spring in front of their families. They won't get to. Um, they, they won't get to, you know, go to their senior prom. 
Um, there's athletes that are, are missing recruiting opportunities. I mean, this could impact their future. Um, you know, so I, I think this is a time that, that families, um, immediate families need to wrap their arms around young people. Um, you know, there's a small window um, for parents to really, um, you know, um, lead our young people to do the right things during this, this pandemic. You know, once they get 19, 20 and they got their own cars, you know, they're, they're kind of doing things the way they want to do it. Um, but to all my parents, my fellow parents with teenagers that are still in the house, you can take those car keys. Um, you, you can implement rules. And I think that is really, really important to utilize that influence while you have it and, and, and just show some compassion and love, but also inform our young people. Um, because again, they may not be in a high risk area, um, but they can carry the virus and they can pass it on to those um, that are in a high risk area. So let's focus on our young people too, moving forward. All right, Casey, same question to you. How would you improve, what, what recommendations would you have? Um, I, in terms of for outreach, mm -hmm. yes. So I would definitely do more forums like this. Obviously, um, I think that they are great opportunities for various professionals or various people in the communities to give the knowledge that they have and especially using people that the community looks up to, especially. Um, also, in terms of acts, using social media, TikTok, you know, meeting those kids where they are at, like, like Divine said, is, is very important. And um, I know that we really haven't mentioned this, but also focus on that mental health. That's, that's one thing we do not talk about in this community is mental health. But, you know, this this is a very trying time for everybody. And so not we cannot forget that we need to focus on being healthy in our minds, emotionally, spiritually and protecting ourselves and, and our, our children. All right, I'm going to come back to you to wrap it up, Casey, uh, with the one final message. Dr. Humbaugh, uh, what, what message do you want to give people about the importance of COVID-19? What do you want to leave people with? Well, I'll just say, Kevin, I'm very grateful for this, this discussion and all the panelists today and for you. Um, I say let's, you know, let's use the God-given wisdom that we have to celebrate Easter responsibly this year and to stay physically apart and wash our hands frequently. <laughs> All right. Casey, what's the message, the final message you want people to have? We will get through this. We as a people have been through far worse. Hold on. Yes. Hold All on. Right. Dr. Humbaugh, Casey, Pastor Divine, thank you for spending an hour of your time today to go over this thank important you. show. Thank we you. truly appreciate you and helping this. For those of you watching, Thank you so much for spending time with us. This is an important discussion. It's just the kickoff of this. We're going to keep doing these things. We've got other ideas in mind of how to continue and improve our outreach. As we wrap up, tag people, share this. Make sure that as many people as possible see this. The Lexington Health Department is here for everyone. Our values are caring, accountability, respect, equity, and service. And the key word in there right now is equity. And we want to meet people where they are with this. So share this, get it in front of them, do it safely, do, keep the physical and social distancing. For those of you, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, keep an eye on our page and we hope to talk to you very, very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.